I did not have a sermon title to give before the bulletin was printed. So um, the sermon title this morning is Make Your Revolution Relevant. Uh, pray with me right quick. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Lord, if it is not on my manuscript, place it in my mouth. Lord, let the, let the words that you have given me, allow them to be fruitful in the lives of the hearers this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In 1791, two years after the French Revolution began, a voodoo priest and Maroon leader on the French occupied island of Saint Dominique by the name of Duddy Bookman gave the word that it was time to start a revolution. This set in motion events that pitted the slave class versus the ruling white class and the free people of color were in the middle. This word from on high also started a chain of events that involved a clash of the French military the Spanish military, and even the British military. This word from on high, in favor of resisting the system, and in favor of turning the world upside down as they knew it, what was enslaved shall now be free, resulted in the only known successful slave revolt in all of human history. I wanna reiterate that, that in the 4,000 or so odd years of written human history, this is the only account of a successful slave rebellion that resulted in the slave class being freed permanently from the ruling class. With the aid of people like Toussaint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines, the formerly enslaved of Saint Dominique transformed the land of their enslavement into an independent nation through what is known as the Haitian Revolution. These enslaved Africans and Tainos, those who had a higher death rate than their birth rate, went up against all odds and transformed their revolt into a revolution. It is for this reason that when I read Jesus's words recorded in Matthew 21, that I find myself sympathizing, yea, even identifying with the tenant farmers and this Matthean parable. In some earlier 20th century printings of Bibles, especially in study Bibles, this passage found in both the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew would label this parable as the parable of the wicked tenants. And why not? In verse 39, even a murder happens. For so many, when we approach the reading of the biblical text, I'm not saying this for the good people at Church of the Covenant, but our initial response is to theologize what we read. For some reason, unbeknownst to me, many Christians fail to use the simple critical reading skills that we were taught in the second and third grade and were requ required when we took standardized tests and apply it to when we read passages from the Bible. For so many of us Christians, myself included, we begin to create a, a metaphor or an allegory in our heads, and we assign anthropological and theological traits to characters that we read in the texts. Take this Matthean parable, for example, and most of the other parables for that matter. It is so easily that we can readily see God as the creator of the vineyard, which automatically makes the son the one and only Jesus. And because of the, influences of the influences of the early church traditions, traditional interpretations would assign the multiple servants or slaves coming to collect payments as that of the Old Testament prophets rejected by ancient Israel. Therefore, so many end up approaching this text and identifying with the servants, of course, but they identify with them as a wicked and detestable people. It's the same operating theology that provides us with amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So, so many identify with the people not worthy that they see the vineyard as the grand benevolence of the landowner. So that must be the God character. They see the walls as protection around them and the wine press as a luxury and a watchtower as a place for the agents of the Lord as a built-in security force. However, our traditional assumptions may lead to myopic interpretations that allow for us as modern day readers to identify with those seen as a disempowered people. 
So here we are in Jesus's parable with a bunch of tenants who are almost automatically seen as wicked and ungrateful for what God has given them. That sounds about right as far as what so many Christians end up hearing, that we as humanity are never fully grateful for what God has done for us, for what God has provided for us. Because far too often it becomes easy to equate God's goodness with material abundance. The house, the car, the promotion on the job are nothing more than the vineyard, the watchtower, and the wine press found in our text this morning. However, I think that such an interpretation misses what Jesus is doing by telling this particular parable to a crowd of people listening to his every word. I believe Jesus is doing a clear critique of the political, social, and economic system and laying it bare before the feet of those who support the Roman Empire. Why else would they want to have him arrested once he got done telling it? If you, could, if you would continue to journey with me into this pericope, I would like to turn the traditional interpretation of this parable on its head and start by asking the leading question. If you run the allegory all the way out to the end, why would traditional interpretation posit God as an absentee landlord? In verse 33, we have the story of a man planting a vineyard. This establishes that the vineyard had not been there before, which thereby implies that the landowner had to have purchased the land at some point. But be aware, in first century Palestine, much like our own inner cities, there's rarely unoccupied land. In order to acquire land, someone else must be displaced. That in order for this landowner to acquire land, he probably had to buy out the previous owner, perhaps, for lack of payment on property taxes or foreclosure. That also would imply that the new owner probably acquired tacitly the former tenants who still needed a job. And it could be assumed that the landowner was moderately wealthy. A landowner who planted a vineyard and could still afford to keep tenants meant that for the four years it would take for the vineyard to produce a yield worthy of converting into wine, that means that he, and I do mean he, that he as, as a male landowner had enough means and money to maintain vineyards and enough money to sustain the livelihood of the tenants. So why, why I can't help but identify with the tenants is because every time I leave the four walls of my apartment and see the black and brown faces, I see the tenants in this text. Every time I go into a restaurant and pick up my to-go order, every time I go into the grocery store and I met with a cashier or a clerk, every time I encounter a frontline worker, I'm meeting someone who is a tenant. Every unhoused person on the street corner asking for a little bit to get by is a tenant. Every mother pushing a stroller with kids walking in tow to the laundromat is a tenant. Every time you drive down the street and see everyday people sitting on porches, waiting on bus stops, you see a tenant. Every time I turn on the news and see the faces of those participating in protests, holding signs and chanting out their despair, I see tenants. I propose that what we see in this Matthean text, excuse me, in Jesus's parable, are tenants who are so fed up with the system that they can't think of anything to do but revolt. These tenants got it in their mind to revolt because they were part of the peasant class in the agrarian economy of first century Palestine. They were what Southern culture would call sharecroppers, those who lived on the land they worked but did not own the land. These people were on the lowest rung of the socioeconomic ladder in a caste system based on religious and cultural affiliation. They had no recourse against a retainer class that wrote laws that sounded just, but allowed for tax loopholes for the wealthy, allowed for no bid contracts for work and provided for outright land grabs. So these tenants, I believe, were faced with no great options. They looked up one day and realized they didn't have anything to lose. Their options, as I see, were pretty dichotomous. They only had about two real decisions in front of them. It was as though they had to pick between the lesser of two evils. Either continue to work to make an absentee landowner even more wealthy as they remained poor 
or to revolt. Now, now Jesus does not offer a reason why they revolted in the telling of the story, but the exegetical implication is that they were being wronged in the deepest way possible to the point that they even commit murder. The son being sent to collect the profits of the harvest was the embodiment of the cruelty of the landowner. You see, the way the system worked, the tenants functioned as unwilling participants. Their food and shelter was dependent on their work. If they refused to work, they'd be evicted and kicked out. However, if they decided to stay on, keep their head down, and produce for the absentee landowner, sure, they'd keep their food and shelter, but at the same time, they'd be making someone else rich and never see any of the benefits. Up until this point, the tenants were seemingly okay with the system as long as they got what they felt was owed to them. However, in my sanctified imagination, something must have happened that jolted them. Something even Jesus doesn't dare say in public to the listening crowd. But something must have, something, something, something must have happened. There had to have been a shift. Something that was nominally working was suddenly broken and broken beyond repair. Maybe, 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 maybe the tenant farmers heard about some Roman soldier on patrol who had stopped one of their own and beat him mercilessly, putting a knee on his neck. And that was the last straw. Maybe they heard about some Roman soldiers on a midnight raid bursting into the house of one of their neighbors and one of their neighbors who was just sleeping bad at night ended up dead. I believe Jesus isn't so much telling this parable to point out his own crucifixion by his own people, which is the traditional interpretation, but rather I think Jesus is sending a message to the masses, to the tenants, to the peasants, to the sharecroppers, that the way you've been doing things isn't working. Jesus is saying that it isn't wise to keep on doing the same thing and expect different results. While stories of tenant rebellions and slave rebellions are common throughout the course of human history, oftentimes they become footnotes in the history books because history is always told from the point of the victors. So I believe that Jesus is actually telling his people, don't revolt, but start a revolution and make it relevant. We can easily theologize this passage because it sounds good, but if we do that, we miss the on the ground message that Jesus is sending. We can too easily see the building of the wall as God's protection, the wine press as evidence of God's blessings, and the watchtower as God's defense against our enemies, but fail to see the fence as keeping people contained to the same political, social, economic, and theological worldview. The wine press providing nothing but an on-site location, an opportunity to be drunk on the eve of the revolution and fail to see that the watchtower was posted with guards not to keep an unknown and invisible enemy out, but to keep the tenants from running away and escaping. If we understand the parables as subversive speech, Jesus is saying that in order to be a revolutionary and to be a relevant revolutionary, one must not continue the same practices of old, but to do a new thing. And Jesus is saying, follow me. I can hear Jesus saying embedded in the coded language, while others have rejected me, I dare you to follow me, accept me, believe in me. Conventional wisdom says that Jesus was crucified because he came to humanity in love and kindness. And those that called for his death were supremely wicked and evil because they killed him for no reason. That's what conventional wisdom says, but reality says something different. Reality states that the government lynched him because he was threatening the very stability of a system that was reliant on a caste system. And Jesus showed up speaking truth to power. Jesus came to Jerusalem threatening to turn the world upside down. Jesus came to town being a revolutionary and his revolution was so relevant that they plotted to have him arrested and ultimately killed. So I submit to you today as listeners of the word of God that the Lord has already given us power to be radical revolutionaries like Jesus. For we know that the crucifixion was not the ultimate end of the story, but there was a resurrection that, occur that occurred, standing as our example that God has the final say in the lives of people like you and me. God has endowed us with the ability to speak out against the system and to not be afraid, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but one of power. So the next time you feel like revolting against this system, remember it needs to be revolutionary. It needs to be a revolutionary act. It needs to be a revolutionary speech. When you look deep inside yourself and find the intestinal fortitude to do more than just rally and clang against the system, 
make sure it's a revolution and a relevant one at that. Amen.